All right, and we are live. Welcome to another episode of our Community Office Hours. Today we have the CDK for Terraform team with us, and we'll be discussing all of the new things in the 0.6 release. But before we dive in, uh, we do need to cover our community guidelines, and there's just four here, which are to be welcoming, inclusive, friendly, and patient at all times. Be considerate, be respectful, and be professional. Uh, they should all be pretty obvious uh, to being a human being, but uh, welcome to the internet. So moving on, we have some familiar faces and some new ones. So why don't we get to know everyone that is here with us today? So uh, starting with the magnificent Daniel, would you like to uh, reintroduce yourself? Hey there. Yeah, I am Daniel Dreyer. I'm the engineering manager for the CDK for Terraform team. And then how about Sebastian next? Yeah, hi, I'm Sebastian Kaufman, and I'm one of the engineers of the CDK for Terraform team. Happy to be here. Beautiful. And uh, Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah McDonald. I'm the new product manager uh, working with the CDK for Terraform team. So happy to be here. Last but not least, John. Hi, I'm John Steinick. I am a community contributor to the Terraform for CDK team and excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So obviously our main topic and the meat and potatoes of our little meal here today is going to be the release, but we also want to go into our, our two new guests here because uh, one of them, Sarah, is a new is the product manager joining for the CDK for Terraform team. And then we also have John, who's a, as he said, a big community contributor. So why don't we start with Sarah, just so the audience can get to know everyone that is here. You know, I would love to hear a little bit about your background, you know, how you wound up where you are, because that's always a good, you know, a good thing to know about the people that are on the team and just around the product in general, so we can know your perspectives and experiences that you're bringing. Sure. So, um, yeah, a little bit about my background. Um, my first job out of college was at an art museum. So some things have changed since then. <laughs> um, I transitioned into tech about six years ago, first as a technical writer and uh, then moving into product roles. Um, most recently, um, I was actually working on another HashiCorp product. So I'm new to CVKTF, but not new to HashiCorp um, for the past Two plus years, I was the product manager for our HashiCorp Learn platform. So if anyone is looking to learn at all about products um, that we offer, you know, I check it out. It was a great project to work on, um, but I'm really excited to kind of transition into working with this, with the CDK TF team. Um, I think the reason I was really excited about the project is because my own kind of technical background is more in like web development, JavaScript is the first language I learned to, to use. Um, you know, my last team, I was working with devs who were mostly writing in TypeScript. So it was really exciting to learn about this new project where um, kind of opens up the capabilities of Terraform and infrastructure as code to, you know, to a new audience, letting people use their preferred uh, syntax. So yeah, just excited to kind of get started and hopefully to get to know a lot of people in the community and hear what you're working on. Interesting, interesting. I didn't realize that uh, that you begun with JavaScript. It's something that I also began with. It's amazing how quickly it changes and how many things it's being used for nowadays. Uh, you know, ten years yes. ago, I would have not have looked up and thought, "Oh, hey, we're writing infrastructure with it." Uh, but hey, it works out. It was a good bet. Um, you you, you kind of touched on it, but what what prompted your your move? Like, what was the was, was the primary prompt just your familiarity with it and, and what they were doing? But what was the big like, okay, yeah, I'm definitely interested and I want to move over into product around the, the CDK team? Yeah, well, I think, um, you know, working on the Learn platform was a great way to start at HashiCorp because I really got kind of familiar with all the products because the platform has tutorials for everything from, you know, Packer, Vagrant, Waypoint, all, you know, the whole kind of um, suite. And so, while I sort of was able to get this general familiarity with the HashiCorp products, you know, I didn't really have the time or space to like go deep with any one of them or really kind of get into working with them um, on, on a deeper level. So I was just excited to kind of find a project where I could more, you know, dive in and kind of get really familiar with um, the code base, the projects, the use cases. And so CDKTF was just such a nice sort of 
I guess, melding of a lot of my interests. Um, so I'm really excited to, to get to join the team. And it's also exciting because it's a project that's had so much community interest and so many people using it in different ways. And I'm just excited to, um, you know, learn, learn more about that. Cause I think there's a lot of different use cases and avenues uh, where the project could evolve. So yeah, that was the draw, I guess. <laughs> nice. Nice. What a journey art to <laughs> through the learn, through the learn platform, through the wonderful world of web technologies now on the CDK team for product. Uh, thanks so much for giving us some of your background. So uh, let's move on here just for time to uh, John. So John, I would, you're one of our big community contributors for the CDK for Terraform. And I would just love to hear a little bit about your background as well. Yeah, so I actually, I work for a company called Perblue when, and we make mobile games. So definitely, definitely a ways away from the infrastructure space. Um, but being, uh, you know, we got our start as a startup, I kind of had multiple roles. Primarily, I'm a developer on the back end, but I definitely got my hand in creating infrastructure. Um, you know, I think at some point, one of my coworkers introduced me to Ansible, and that's kind of where I got my start as coding infrastructure. Before that, it was just kind of, you know, ad hoc scripts and a lot of manual work. And, you know, Ansible was great up until, you know, we started moving more away from EC2 instances and started getting to like other, other types of resources. Um, you know, I was kind of, kind of my journey to get here is, you know, at that point, you know, I was like, okay, Ansible isn't cutting it anymore. I tried out CloudFormation, you know, it fixed some <laughs> problems, introduced some new problems, wasn't quite happy with it. Um, had a remembrance of a reInvent talk where they're saying like, oh, you know, there's something happening for some languages that can use CloudFormation. Um, I don't think it was CDK at the time, but when I went around to look at it, it was like, I came across the AWS CDK. And again, you know, I gave that a try. I was like, hey, this, this is kind of the promise that I want. But at the time it was still pretty early in its life cycle um, and it, had a few rough edges, especially when you're trying to use C sharp. Um, so, you know, I kept looking, came to Terraform and, you know, definitely was happy with that, uh, but kind of always had that itch in the back of my mind of like, what if, what if there was something better? What if I could actually use, you know, C sharp to write my infrastructure in? And kind of, kind of paused for a while and then I follow, kept following the AWS CDK, and then one day I see a post from Sebastian in their Gitter channel about a product, you know, a project called TerraStack, which, which was just kind of like a proof of concept, like, hey, we can use the CDK concepts to do Terraform. Um, did, you know, bookmarked it, came, and then a couple months later, I came back to it, got some free time, and it, you know, it looked like the project was dead. So I was like, okay, well, I'll fork it. this is open source. I will fork it, start working on it. And then it was probably two weeks later that I saw the first announcement for Terraform CDK, um, which was just like, okay, this is amazing. This is, this is what I want. Um, and I, you know, very quickly reached out and started, started working on it. And yeah. Cool. Cool. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you a question that uh, is a recurring question, and being one of the big com community contributors, I think it'll it'll spark an interesting discussion. And feel free, anyone else, Daniel, Sebastian, Sarah, to jump in. When you when you got into this space and you went to provision your infrastructure, you know, obviously we we come to Terraform and HCL is you know the main course. What about using a different language is so appealing and so essential to you that that drew you to the CDK? Um, I think there's, there's a couple things. One, it's, you know, you know, HCL, while it's not super hard to learn, it's, it is yet another thing to learn. It's not, not what I'm doing most of my day-to-day -day work in. So it's kind of a mind shift that has to take place to, to shift over and do that. Uh, I think another, another big reason is, you know, I know Terraform has modules, but they never quite felt like what I was looking for, you know, especially when I'm doing most of my work as a developer, 
like how obviously I'm doing a lot of modularization structuring code. And like I say, modules just didn't quite line up with that. So the idea of being able to still write the code in the same fashion that I would, you know, write anything else, that that's really appealing. It makes sense. It makes sense. So it fits your existing workflow and the mental models you have for how you're already developing. So it just moves one to one. That sound right? Yeah, yeah. It's like you don't have to. Why, why should writing your infrastructure code be any different than your application code? Makes sense. Sounds like what we've heard before, Daniel, right? Just a little. I think we even <laughs> have a whole project just for that. <laughs> of course, of course. So something else I'd like to, to ask you, John, if you wouldn't mind, is around your approach as a community contributor. Uh, for Obviously, we owe, anyone who's in the coding space always has that as sort of an ideal or something we want to do in terms of contributing. When you approach the CDK for Terraform, what is your mindset around like, ah, this is something that needs to be done and I'm going to, to, to go and do it. Like, how do you identify the issues and then how do you decide when you're going to put in time to these or not? I'd say there's, there's a mixture and it's kind of evolved as I've been working on the project. Um, I think early on, it was very much a, I see the potential of this project, but it really can't do what I need it to do yet. So what can I do to like, most quickly get it to that point where like, hey, this this has enough features where I would actually start to use it. Hmm. Um, you know, over, you know, we kind of hit that critical mass of, okay, now this is still useful. Um, and I think it, it transitioned a lot into like, I'd see, you know, okay, other people are starting to use this, but they're running into problems. And, you know, I really want to want this to, to work. So I I would spend the time like, okay, they have a bug. I can fix that. I'll, I'll do that. Uh, so I think there's a lot of that. Uh, you know, there's still some, like, I'm personally trying to use it for things and finding issues and wanting to get those fixed. Uh, there's a little bit of a, I see the release plan they've put together and it's like, I have a little bit of spare time. Maybe I can help them with something that they want to get done for the release. Nice. Nice. So to, to go on that, I'd like to just ask Daniel, Sebastian, and Sarah all a question just sort of around that um, from each of your perspectives, from management perspective and engineer's perspective, and then a product perspective. When it comes to community contributors with the CDK for Terraform, what is what is all of your all's approach to, to encouraging that and also you know, bringing those things in? And uh, how, how do you guys see that in terms of making what it is that you do better? Why don't we start with Daniel? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, this, <clears throat> the genesis of this project was Sebastian as a person out in the community building it himself. Right. And so this has really deep roots in the community. It's very organic of a project that way. And so getting community contributions is incredibly important. I think there's an interesting, um, tension there because what we what we want to avoid is a situation where someone brings a lot of energy and time and care in and shows up with like a giant pull request that we're like yo sorry we're actually doing this a different way because that's a huge bummer and so i think the way to the way to work through that you know for anyone listening who wants to to pitch in who has ideas is reach out uh, you know, the very simplest, like file an enhancement request and just say, and also I'm interested in building this, or if you see something in the backlog, um, if you see something in the backlog that you're interested in building, comment that on it. And, you know, someone from the team can talk with you and plan, and we can sort of design it together and, and see if there's common ground to figure out a solution there, but very much, you know, open to community contributions. How about from a product perspective, Sarah? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think I'd echo what Daniel said. Um, it's, it's always really great when people file issues, especially when they're kind of specifically including information about their use case. Like I'm trying to solve this problem and I think this would help me solve this problem. Um, from a product perspective, that's just hugely helpful. So 
in addition to what Daniel said about filing an issue to say what you'd like to see, but also to share with us why you'd like to see that and what problem you think that feature would solve. That's just invaluable <laughs> to us from a product perspective. So yeah, I think sharing that context, um, you know, through an issue also, you know, we have um, a section on the discuss forum um, where if, if you feel like you're not quite ready to file an issue and you just have questions like going to that HashiCorp uh, for community forum, and um, we can probably share a link to that, um, you know, just a great place to just sort of ask questions if you feel like you're not quite ready to file an issue. Um, but yeah, just sharing the context for why and what problem you're trying to solve is, is pretty much everything a product manager could ask for. <laughs> nice. And then finally, last but not least, Sebastian, at some point, we got to capture the whole origin story since this began with you. But I'd love just to, to hear your perspective on community contributors, uh, both from beforehand and then now as you're it being an official HashiCorp thing. Um, well, I mean, like, like for the project as it is right now, so uh, I just uh, double check, but we do have like a bunch of uh, good like issues labeled at good first issues. So these are usually, I hope at least, uh, well spec out and are pretty much well just ready to go in, in theory at least. Uh, but other than that, like I mean, contributing is not necessarily only code in the end, right? So like even uh, I don't know just a bug report or like even like uh, docs or stuff like this, right? So that's that all helps. Uh, bug reports, uh, the more context, the better, of course. Uh, but even if it's just like a quick. I don't have time, but this doesn't work uh, for this, this reason. Uh, that's also quite quite helpful since I think uh, most of the time people will just go over it and ignore it and say, okay, that doesn't work. Uh, but contributing this back uh, is immensely helpful. Um, and yeah, and then like from our point of view, I think it's, uh, well, we have to get well, like a bit faster perhaps here and there uh, with providing feedback. Um, so that uh, like depends on the volume of issues, uh, of course. So it's like a bit going up and down, uh, depending on, on the life cycle of, of the product release thing. Um, but yeah, so uh, it, essentially staying in touch. And I think that's uh, what John and I did in particular in the early days. Uh, so like, you know, talking with this quite frequently and, um, you know, we're trying to get this off the ground somehow together. So this was... Yeah, quite good times. Nice, nice. Well, thanks for all the uh, perspective around community there. I know that's a that's always a question with these products that are open source, especially this one that began fully, fully, obviously it still is. Um, but just for people that are interested in contributing, it's always good to give them the overarching view from all of our different perspectives. So moving on into our next bit, unless anyone had uh, anything else on that. No? All right, well, uh, we're going to move on to the main uh, portion of our episode today, and that's going to be the new features of the 0 0.6 release. And the first one is going to be a major story, a story about testing. Uh, Daniel, would you like to tell us about it? Uh, and then I believe we have a demo uh, from Sebastian. Yeah, I am super stoked. So the whole point of this, like John was saying, is to have an infrastructure as code experience that is you know, as, as similar as possible to writing normal software. And it sort of, we all know that when you write software, you, you have to test it. It's a very painful experience. If you write, I've written software without, without testing it. And I end up very sad. Every time I've, I've sort of like taken that shortcut, I've ended up extremely sad. And the, the challenge with writing tests is it can be an enormous amount of work. And so what I'm, I'm really excited about is the particular approach to testing here, which is snapshot testing using Jest. So um, this is, you know, Jest is, I, I think Sebastian, is it fair to say probably the, the most popular web testing, a front-end testing tool, one of the most popular. In the, in the JavaScript ecosystem, yes, mm -hmm. I would probably say so, yeah. Um, so, you know, widespread familiarity there, but usually people use it to test a front-end, 
And so it's interesting to use it for this. So the, the, the point of this is you, you use Jest to generate a snapshot. That means to generate the you know, Terraform config that CDK for Terraform generates under certain circumstances. And then you rerun your tests after you've made a change, you refactor something, you expect it to make no changes and you run your tests via Jest, it synthesizes it out, there should be no changes. There's no resources created, there's no resources destroyed, it's just the same. And what's slick about it is you get very comprehensive coverage because all the logic is tested through a few cases and you can see, you know, I created one more, I don't know, one more EC2 instance than I meant to. I destroyed uh, and created one fewer than I, I'm no longer creating my S3 buckets. You see that right away and you don't have to wait for a Terraform plan, apply anything to run. It's very, very quick. And then if you want, if you know, there's some part of your code base that's changing more frequently and you, you don't want, just actually gives you really good tool, tooling for watching that and like live updating your snapshot as you code. So you can like, have a just watch running and it just shows you I you know added you added a thing are you sure you wanted that yup I added it and it will go and update your snapshot it's it's very convenient but you can also add specific matchers saying I want to make sure no matter what that you know my EC2 instances uh, are you know in a particular VPC my S3 buckets are exist at all whatever the the assertion there is you can make specific fine-grained assertions um, in place of snapshotting everything, because you may not care. There may be some parts of your code base where you don't need tests to fail just because it changed at all. Um, so yeah, I'll hand that over to Sebastian for a demo, but I'm, I'm super stoked. I think this is a huge step forward for the sort of vision of the project as you know, writing infrastructure as code with the same power and tooling like you would write anything else. So it's good. Take it away, Sebastian. Yep. Yeah, so um so font size okay. Yeah, cool. Uh, looks good to me, but we'll see good. if anyone good. has any other opinions. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, right. So I threw together like a quick um, CDK for Terraform application. Uh, so this is the main entry into the application. We are having, we are seeing like a TypeScript app. Um, and yeah, so it's just a, like a Terraform stack class, which equals like a Terraform workspace in the end. So like a Terraform state in the end. So that's like the terminology for we're doing here. and. Um, so what I want to show today is like this little construct. So in the CDK terminology, like a construct uh, is like a, something along the lines of a Terraform module. Um, with the difference that it's not namespaced uh, when it's run out to the Terraform workspace, right? So it's like, a, like inline when you look at it from a state point of view. Anyway, um, so what is this? So this is like an AWS role for um, GitHub Action Runners. So probably some of you might have seen it yesterday. There was a tweet going around on Twitter, um, which allows to use an OpenID Connect provider in AWS to actually uh, authenticate your GitHub Action to AWS without using using long-lived credentials, um, which is quite quite nice if you want to use this to interact with AWS. And this is essentially like a, like a really small thing, uh, like a small role in the end, um, but it has like a bunch of configuration which might make, you know, it's like very specific. So there's like this uh, thumbprint, which is essentially the fingerprint of the SSL certificate of the GitHub Action Runner. Um, so you have to get this, it's just typed here in this thing, and this has to be exactly like this. Um, there's also the, um, condition uh, for the AWS role, which needs to be in a certain layout. So you have to like a few moving, moving parts, right? And so you might want to take this construct and distribute it within the organization so that everyone can use it and deploy it um, for, for their account or whatnot. And so essentially you could take this entire construct and share it out as, as an NPM package or like a pipe package or I don't know, uh, 
uh, whatever whatever you, you want in the end, right? So you could use this as a distribution mechanism. Um, what you are doing, but I think for, for this case, it makes a lot of sense to use um, these kind of unit tests and central tests, right? So you, you want to distribute a piece of functionality, be able to make sure that it, that it works on the unit level and then other people can use it. Um, so that's the, that's the code. So we are we're dealing with two resources here. And then the layout is in like in the, in the product itself is uh, pretty much up to the user. So, but I decided to, to inline my tests right next to the resource. So I have this uh, construct placed in the components AWS row folder, uh, place it into the index.ts file. And then right next to it, we have like a little test file here. Um, and from here, we are actually using, or we are referencing the class or the construct we, we just saw. And we are we stuffing it into our testing, testing files and our matchers here. So there are like a few, so few matchers which we are using to match a snapshot itself. That's, um, um, that's just just functionality and um, which takes essentially the output. So when you run this testing soon scope, um, it's actually taking the construct, initializing it, and it's synthesizing it out to Terraform compatible JSON. So that's a format which you use. Also, when you when you do a CDKTF deploy or a CDKTF diff, that's essentially what we are going to use uh, for Terraform deployments, it's like the artifact. Um, and that's what is being simulated here, essentially. Um, and if you have never seen uh, Jest, so it. In this case, it creates an, a dedicated snapshot file. We are just well, placing, placing the output, which, which comes back from this thing. And yeah, here you can see this is a JSON structure. And the neat thing is now what you can do, you run yarn test uh, in your project root directory. It's gonna run, uh, it's collecting all the different test files based on a, a regular expression which is matching this test.ts in this case. And then it's it's doing this. Okay, so far so good. And so now let's see and perhaps change a bit somewhere. I don't know, perhaps someone makes a typo and gets rid of this here. Then we might see an arrow <coughs> in the diff. I would expect at least. Uh, there we go. So uh, I hope you can see it. Um, so since it's like, well, like uh, just inline JSON more or less, it's like a bit difficult to read, but you can see the changes are highlighted here. So the green part is the expected part. So we see the colon here uh, and here it got removed, right? So it's like, even if the JSON itself is pretty, well, uh, complex and you, can't really understand it at the first glance, uh, it's still easy to spot what actually changed. Um, so let's revert this. And yeah, and then we have like um, also custom matches where we can expect, okay, that like the, the construct class here contains any, any kind of uh, IM role or like any, any construct get generated by an IM role class, uh, which might make sense if you like have like conditional role creation parts based on logic, based on input logic perhaps. Um, and there's also like the same, but with actual matching of attributes of this thing. Um, so again, if you change this here, I think you will see an error. And yeah, and I think what, what's also there in theory, which I haven't, done here so far, but let's see, perhaps, I don't know, this just works. Um, something diff, I think, was it diff? Deploy, plan, to plan. Um, oops. 
So, and I believe, so I haven't tried this before. Um, so here we see, okay, this, uh, this IAM role matcher didn't work out since uh, well, the name is, is not working. Uh, let's make this working again. And then see if we can actually plan this. I probably doubt it since it's not read in a stack since we are just dealing with a with an individual construct, which uh, is not part of any stack and um, there's no provider or anything. So it's like just the raw logic of, of this part of the infrastructure. So it's probably, yeah, okay. No. It's, that's, well, I haven't tried this before. I should, I should have tried it. Uh, but anyway, like I think if you if you wrap this in a, in, a, in a stack, depending on how much time you have, I can try this. Um, or I can read the doku perhaps. Let's read the doku. Uh, testing. Snapshot testing integration with Terraform to be planned. Full send app. Let's just try this. If you if you run out of time for, for this section, just uh, let me know. You can pass the stack. I can wrap this. This app here. App endpoint. It is All right, a very I see. Realistic way All right, doing I this. see. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually have to create a class here in nine, so it's like uh, it's missing the um, the abstraction which we using in to send this product uh, this uh, this construct here. But I think we should be able to make it work anyway. And. Yeah. By the way, we are using here a private provider. So, like another way to to get the um, the, the provider is like the, the preview provider would just use the latest version of CDKTF and uh, the provider itself. If you need a specific version, you can actually um, specify this um, uh, in the CDKTF JSON, and then there's a command CDKTF get to get like whatever version you're you're stuck on for whatever reason. Um, oop. from constructs, from stack, from stack, and app. There we go. So now we have something which might be deployable. Oh, we have a testing app. Uh, don't think we need that. While uh, Sebastian uh, works through his code here, I did have a question yeah. from the chat that perhaps uh, Sebastian Daniel, Sarah, or John, you can answer. And that is, is this going to be the preferred way of testing over TerraTest, Kitchen Go approaches? I think I can jump on that one. Yeah. So this is very strictly a CDK for Terraform testing tool. And the, the thing to keep in mind here is keep it, remember what we're testing here, which is this is testing the Terraform config that CDK for Terraform generates. So if your logic, if your key logic that you need to test because you're changing it is in CDK for Terraform, that is, is if it's implemented in TypeScript or once we add a Python test runner in Python or what have you, then it makes sense to test at this boundary testing you know, HCL Terraform, in principle, you could shim this to run a test against a Terraform module, but it wouldn't get you much because all you'd be testing is that you're using the same module that you already knew you're using. This doesn't, uh, 
this the most this will do is it will run a plan and to validate and confirm that those will actually run successfully. But the the you know where this is useful is testing at that interface boundary because the CD the the Terraform configs that CDK for Terraform generates are usually uh, almost purely declarative unless you're doing something really weird. And code that's 100% declarative, you don't really generally need to test because your test logic is basically a snapshot. It's when you have conditional logic that testing becomes really interesting, right? And so um, there are other tools for testing HCL Terraform that this isn't trying to compete with, uh, but this is sort of the only game in town for testing CDK for Terraform. Uh, I can't get it to work for some reason. Uh, probably I'm doing something wrong. Um, uh, I'll figure it out later. That's okay. We'll yeah. So uh, I think the, the point of how it how it works is clear. Um, yeah. And then you can the other sort of test matchers there that you can do. You can run, uh, expect it to validate to plan successfully, which just runs Terraform plan and sees if it runs without errors. And then there's a to be valid Terraform, which just runs a Terraform validate. Um, and you know those are again the, those aren't those aren't testing. They're not like provisioning your resources and making sure the expected thing provision, but most of the time, if you're generating, if your logic was correct and you're generating valid, simple HCL, JSON formatted HCL, uh, that's the point that people really care about testing. And that's because that's where your conditional logic is. Yeah. And just to give some uh, context to, uh, people who aren't familiar with, with snapshot testing and just because I, uh, for better or for worse, have a good amount of experience with it. And at least in the world of front end, the whole idea was, you know, you write your fancy React code, for example, and ultimately it turns into HTML and it outputs everything that it is. And you use that, instead of looking at your code, you look at that output since that's ultimately what's being used and you can detect changes there. So the snapshot testing um, moving away from something more like integration or end-to-end -end testing helps you catch surprises and gotchas, like as Daniel said, may exist in some conditional logic or may not be so obvious because you change one little thing. So the thing is that for me, at least when I got into snapshot testing, that was odd was that every change was a failed test. <laughs> so I, st I stopped looking at it as, as a failed test and more looking at it as a what snapshot testing is doing is it is letting me know, hey, stuff changed. Make sure you check it out. Did you mean to do it? And if you did, you know, you you run that the just command to say, yep, let's that's good. Let's keep going and continue forward. So it's it's like a good just extra. Did you mean to do this uh, type thing? And correct me if I'm wrong, of course, uh, Sebastian, Daniel, and uh, Sarah and John. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right, and that's a really good call out because it is it is sort of a different approach to testing people. Uh, who aren't familiar with that think unit testing. This isn't exactly, we're calling it unit testing because it's a familiar term, but snapshot testing really is its, its own testing idiom. And for folks getting into this who haven't done that before, it's definitely worth looking up how to think about snapshot testing in general, because it's, it's really, really cool. It's very efficient to get a lot of test coverage, but it's a different way to think. So that's a, that's a really, really good call out. Yeah, and just to add to that, the, the origins of snapshot testing were because the engineers prior to having it there were spending too much time testing. <laughs> and so it is when we say it's not quite unit testing, it's because it's supposed to be faster. It's supposed to be a lot faster. You get a snapshot. Well, so I, I want to jump in here because I, I saw the same story play out before I was at, at HashiCorp. I was at Puppet and we had the exact same stories, right? And Puppet had great, you could write RSpec tests for Puppet code, but over years and years and years, it was like maybe 1% of the community ended up actually doing it because it's an enormous amount of work to write really good tests. And for a declarative language, you end up duplicating your whole, what do you do? Write everything twice, once in RSpec and once in your original language. Like it's a huge amount of work. And so what I really, really like about this approach is you get an enormous amount of leverage out of a relatively small amount of test coverage. One thing I didn't mention is 
we actually, I got to give a plug here. We actually use snapshot testing in CDK for Terraform internally. And the Mozilla Pocket folks who are going to be in a future community office hours, uh, they started doing snapshot testing using Jest with CDK for Terraform before we even added this. They were, they, they rolled their own. And so um, in, in a lot of ways, we sort of, you know, we, and then uh, AWS CDK also used snapshot testing via Jest initially. So, um, you know, this is a, a pretty well proven out approach. Indeed. And I would love to get products perspective on it, Sarah, uh, the testing story and what you see around this, your perspective on it and what it could lead to. Well, so currently, you know, um, this is supported for folks who are using TypeScript and the uh, um, TypeScript projects. So I think that what we definitely want to hear from people who are doing testing is sort of what's working for them and for us to figure out sort of what they need and what should come next. Um, so potentially that means, you know, scoping out what is this kind of unit testing equivalent look like for Python? What does it look like for people working in other languages? Um, and then I think there's a kind of bigger story to explore about, um, you know, do we kind of in integrate with other sort of testing methods for more like integration testing sort of, I think that's still very to be defined kind of like how the testing story evolves. But yeah, I think shorter term is more just seeing how this works for people with TypeScript and thinking about how to provide the functionality for other, other languages. It's interesting, more testing for more people. Like it. <laughs> and then, and then John, from a community perspective, is this like, did you see this coming or were, were you like, yeah, I've known about this. <laughs> and what do you think of it? Um, you know, I, it was definitely something that had been talked about, but yeah, to see it, see it come together and come together as quickly as it did was, was, it was interesting. Um, you know, I, I, my first exposure to snapshot testing was actually working on the Terraform CDK project. Um, so like it's, and it's, it's a, you know, it's a cool way to do it. Like it's, it's nice to be able to just say like, Hey, give me a test, like very quickly, like test this out without having to specify every individual detail that you want to test. Um, you know, I, I, I will say there are like any, any method of testing, there are downsides and, you know, sometimes you can get a little bit of, or, or one of the, one of the fun ones is you made your initial snapshot, but your initial snapshot was actually what was wrong. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it, it, like anything, you kind of, you get, you work through it and it, it allows you to do a lot quickly. Yeah. That is always funny when you commit the wrong snapshot and you're like, oh, well, <laughs> Jess just doesn't like me now. Nice. Well, do we have any more thoughts from uh, anyone around the, the testing story here? No? All right. Well, that is, that is the big feature of the day. And obviously that's gonna fit into a lot of workflows. I know that uh, personally, in, in all of my experiences with snapshot and just testing, it saved a ton of time and a ton of headache, uh, especially when you're working with other people and you're like, dude, don't change this. And they change it. Well, now you got something to be like, yo, I told you. <laughs> so, all right, moving on to the next uh, features here. I know we have, that was our big one. We have some smallish ones to cover. And the next one we wanted to talk about was Terraform functions in the CDK, right, Daniel? Yeah, let's do it. So Terraform functions is, is interesting. I want to I want to jump back a little bit to the, the ordering here. So for a person using CDK for Terraform, it's, it's relatively easy to imagine you're just, I'm going to describe why this is hard because it's not obvious. If you're just sort of coming in at first, it feels like you're just building infrastructure code directly in say TypeScript. And then you run CDK TF to, in, plan it, deploy it, destroy it, whatever. And it most of the time it just works. And the order of what is actually happening internally is not necessarily obvious to a, a first time user. But what's underneath, it's, it's synthesizing some Terraform config. 
And so there's a whole bunch of interesting engineering problems because what happens at Terraform runtime isn't available in TypeScript because by the time Terraform apply is running, TypeScript is long done and gone. And so if you want to use, if you want to do something even a little bit dynamic, let's say it's a really, really common operation to get some, uh, some data from a Terraform data source and then change it a little bit with a function, even if you're just, I don't know, uh, you're, you're trimming a string and you want to change that a little bit, reformat it and shove it into an attribute of some provider. That's all well and good, but so far in CDK for Terraform, there hasn't been an idiomatic way to use Terraform functions to do that. You've had to use the escape hatch, which means that you have to change uh, the, the generated Terraform config afterward, which requires users to make exactly that kind of mental model shift that John was seeking to avoid, uh, where you're not sort of in that headspace of I'm just writing TypeScript, I'm just writing Python. Uh, you actually have to think about how it works to sort of monkey patch that with the escape hatch. And that's, it works, it has worked, people do it, but we've known you can do better. Uh, and this release adds a more native representation of Terraform functions. Sebastian, you wanna, you wanna show what that looks like? Any more to say about it that I missed? Um, yeah, sure. Let me share my screen again. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so same project, uh, so same place. Um, zoom in a bit into this part here. So uh, as Danny just mentioned, so we, we introduced the uh, function like the FN um, class in, in this release. This essentially wraps, um, I think, all the native functions of Terraform. Um, in a composable way, you still have to know, of course, or like to be aware at least, that this is not running at, um, so this is not running at compile time. So like when, when actually TypeScript is compiled or even executed, uh, this is running or like whatever you get back here is, is gonna run um, at deploy time or like at Terraform in flight time, however you call it. Um, so how, how this in the end looks is so that when I would use it and more importantly is whenever you can't, so whenever you have something which is available as a, as a data source or like as some computed value which you don't know ahead of time uh, and you have to, to deal with this to some extent, right? Um, and as you can see here, so it's uh, quite a nice experience. So you can just uh, like search what you want, uh, you get the link to the documentation. Um, and there's also some inline documentation. So it's quite, quite nice since you don't have to look it up all the time. Um, and yeah, you can compose it and, and do stuff with it, but you can't, ex or like don't expect that this is like the same, you know, like doing like a lowercase key uh, will just give you a reference to the function in the end in Terraform. And I show you what I mean uh, using the testing thing again. Um, oh, let's just do it that way. So you can compose the functions together so you can wrap it into, into each other. Um, and then you run the test now. It has to compile, of course, and it's trying to test. Um, and you will see that it's in our little diff here. So we lost the, uh, the lower part. Um, and yeah, in the end, so this will be evaluated by Terraform in the end. Uh, in this case, now we will have the, where is it? I think it's hidden under the back of the window here. I'm a bit lost, but perhaps my screen is too big. Anyway, 
I thought I might see it. Anyway, I definitely see that we lost the lower function here. Um, and so it's only upper. So in the end, the result would be uh, Terraform would, would make the string like an uppercase string um, at runtime of Terraform. Um, and I think what's, yeah, that's essentially covering all the functions. So you don't have to use escape it anymore, um, which Daniel was saying is like this uh, override. Right, so that was behavior before. You have to somehow do this, you know, manually and uh, type something here and actually know what what's happening. So from that point of view, it's quite quite improvement. And back to cool. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah, that <laughs> your your example of what it looks like otherwise uh, looks far less pleasant than the newer the newer way. Uh, so this is this is a nice improvement. Um, Daniel, do you have any more to elaborate on that? I mean, it's a simple, it's a pretty yeah. straightforward improvement. I think it sort of a, Sebastian covered it. Indeed, indeed. And uh, from a product or community standpoint or community contribution standpoint, Sarah and John, did you have any any thoughts on on Sebastian's demo? No. Okay. <laughs> I just think in general, right, it's really great to see the product evolving a, more and more away from having to use that like escape hatch sort of um, workflow. So it's just great to see, you know, more more steps towards that. Yeah, I would just say, you know, there are a lot of Terraform functions. So as as you in the, the community start trying them out. If you find anything wrong, please, please let us know. Um, we, we tried our best to make sure we got them all working, but we, we didn't individually test all of them. Nice, nice. Well, speaking, uh, not speaking of, but moving on with our, our smaller, our smaller uh, follow-up acts to the testing feature. I know that we had a uh, bash and Zish completion added as well, Daniel. Yeah, not much to tee up there. Uh, Having shell completions is awesome, Sebastian. This will be the easiest demo, right? By the way, you're muted, Sebastian. Yeah. Um, right, so there is, oops um a completion which we have right now so and well the way to get started there was to uh, i think i did uh, the cdk atf completion and then just um you know pipe to tmi that shall uh, config somehow so uh, that's taken care of already so that's why it works and yeah, well, and then you can just um, go through, I don't know, the various parts and see what what comes out there, the different options, and so on and so forth. Um, so I think it's in the end pretty straightforward. Um, but yeah, so it's like pretty easy to install. It's also documented um, in the doc somewhere. Um, at least. It, I think it's documented, doc, but it's pretty pretty self-explanatory in the end. And nice back to cool small quality of life things, but they all stack up. And as you get more and more, it just makes makes everything uh, more pleasant. Very nice. Well, um, I know those were the main features we wanted to talk about, but I know we also wanted to touch on some breaking changes coming up. Correct, Daniel. That's right. Yeah, and I, I think the, the main call out there is uh, in this one more than a lot of other ones, you should really take a look at the upgrade guide. Uh, we had to upgrade the constructs library. And so there's, uh, you know, there's a, a need to upgrade that in your projects. Um, not everyone will have to make changes to their code base, but uh, this is a, a slightly breakier change than yeah, this is not like a Terraform 0.12 to 0.13 level breakage, 
but definitely worth, you know, if, if you're using CDK for Terraform for real for anything and you run an upgrade, just skim that upgrade guide. Uh, we can, uh, I, I, I think we can link that from show notes and yeah, just skim over that and it, it should be pretty straightforward to upgrade. It's pretty self-explanatory. Just wanted to make sure people caught that. Uh, those would be good to know. So make sure you take <laughs> take a look uh, through those. So you're not blindsided by anything. So moving on from the uh, the not fun stuff, that being breaking changes to the future. So what is in the future for the next couple of releases? Talking this morning, Daniel, you said you that um, your team had already gone ahead and planned out a few of the releases. What can we tell the audience today about what's coming up? So 0.7 is uh, sort of tentatively planned. Uh, the place to look at that, if folks are interested in, is to look at our milestones in GitHub. Uh, we're pretty careful about if you take a look right now, you can see it says 0.7 is in planning, not committed. Uh, by mid next week, I'm expecting that caveat to get removed. Um, the way to know what is going in for sure versus what is a stretch goal is that we have this committed uh, GitHub label. So the, the things that are labeled committed, we're very confident we'll get in and the things that aren't, we're gonna do if we can and they might not make it just so that people know how to read our, uh, read our project. The big, the, the big improvement that you should expect to see in 0.7 is a bunch of improvements around the token system um, so, you know, take a look, there's a long punch down list of sort of language pain points. Uh, they're relatively esoteric until you run into one and then they're really annoying. So this is sort of a quality of life improvement that is really, really important. The other big project that's underway that I'm really excited about is a huge, huge docs effort. We are revisiting basically all of the docs and moving them to terraform.io. So you'll see, uh, you know, you'll see that coming up, but there's a, one of the big requests I've been getting is I talk with users, they say, this is great. I like this project, but what about the docs? I need better docs. And so we're doing that. So it'll be a big effort. Um, and I would definitely encourage, you know, community folks as, as that work happens over you know this month and future months to chime in as you know anything that's confusing is a docs bug as far as i'm concerned um so you know filing filing docs issues is a really valid form of contribution sarah do you want to speak a little about sort of directionally further afield from from that Sure. I mean, I think a lot of what we've talked about already today with the um, token system improvements and the docs and um, is really sort of focused around making the user experience uh, more seamless and I think more accessible for, for new folks kind of coming to experiment and try the product. So I think as we move um, forward, we're going to be kind of thinking about ways we can make some of these early use cases just feel really solid and feel um, re like ready to use, ready to pick up and use. Um, we've gotten a lot of great feedback from our sort of early um, community members who are kind of willing to do things that are a little more experimental and test things out, but we wanna make the project accessible to people um, kind of right out more right out of the gate. So I think there's gonna be some work coming around that. Um, We've also talked about, you know, testing a lot today. So it'll be kind of more research and work kind of going into planning out what that testing story looks like outside of TypeScript and for different, um, you know, different cases there. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of exciting work to do with kind of expanding our construct coverage. And I think there'll be some exciting things coming there as well as maybe a few releases in the future. Um, some new functionality for sort of cross-stack or multi-stack um, deployments. So I think there's some exciting things kind of coming down the pipe. But as you know, as Daniel mentioned, we are really reacting to 
you know, issues that are coming in and feedback and, and everything like that. So really encourage people to, uh, you know, let us, let us hear from you sort of like, as you're working with the project, what you're looking to see. So, yeah. Nice. Nice. In other words, don't pull a, you run into a bug and like, just sit there and fume, like, come and tell us. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't, don't fume silently. Come and tell us. <laughs> <laughs> And John, what about uh, from a community contribution standpoint? What what in your in your own roadmap did you have in your head for what you would like to see? You know, what, what what's your perspective on the future? So kind of more more immediately. So the last release, there was a like a convert feature. So you could basically take your existing Terraform project and actually convert it over to CDK. Um, so I've been kind of like trying to fix some of those, some of the rough edges with that initial release, try and expand it. Um, I have a whole, whole bunch of Terraform projects that I'm putting it through the ringer on to see, and I want to, want to get them all, all working is kind of a goal that I have. Um, I, I kind of imagine once I do that, you know, there, there's a lot of areas where I think it's, it's not going to be structured the way I want to. Um, so I'll probably hit into like, what's the refactoring experience like? And I, I, I've looked at enough of our, the code that I know it's, there's gonna be rough edges. So again, kind of like starting to document those rough edges, starting to fix a few of them. Uh, and then I think the final thing is just, you know, helping out with a few of the things that the rest of the team kind of wants to get done for the release. Nice, nice. Well, Future aside, we do have, uh, we did want to make some space for some question and answer. I actually do have two questions, but before we move on to that, did we have any more thoughts on the future? I will take your silence as a no. <laughs> so we, had, we have a question here around best practices, a best practices guide for the CDK uh, for Terraform. So what's the best way to keep the JSON config? You know, what's the best way to structure files? It's always a, it's always an interesting uh, thing you run into when you're, when you're beginning to build out these, these, uh, app, well, not applications, but infrastructure in this case. So this maps, this question actually maps awfully closely to our docs roadmap. Uh, there's a, not a hundred percent of this is going to hit in 0.7 docs wise, but this general sort of theme of best practices is uh, you know, pretty near and dear in terms of topics. I think in terms of our documentation priorities, there's the you know, meat and potatoes documentation of how do you do it at all and sort of an opinionated setup guide. And then there's what our best practices. Um, so I, I think as the, the basic coverage gets fleshed out, we're gonna expand out into this kind of thing. Uh, so that directionally, that's, com that's totally coming. Yeah, the follow-up comment on that was just, they're seeing less open source samples uh, of the CDK for Terraform and just that desire for more examples and documentation, uh, just because of the amount of time it, it, it takes to go through and, and translate. And I know that in the previous release with the uh, convert command, that, that was something that could help but obviously not having to do that to see how something works is <laughs> always, you know, just a bit better. Uh, let's see. And then uh, I've got another question here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer to it, but I'll field it just in case, you, uh, just in case the team knows where this will be. And that's uh, in, in this version, but in upcoming version, will it be possible to convert uh, a TF file to other programming languages beyond TypeScript, which... Well, I'll let you re-answer it. I, I can say that, you know, as a primarily a C-sharp user, there's a, a pretty good chance that I will add C-sharp support coming up here. Um, I, I have, my background is also in Java, so that's probably another one that I would, you know, be willing to take on if, you know, if people are, if the, the desire is there in the community to have that. I would just say that this is very much a, you know, the convert command itself already supports other languages except for Go. 
And so the whole project conversion is very much a function of community interest. So, you know, as folks are interested, please let us know. It, it makes a huge, huge difference in that kind of prioritization. It, it's, you know, definitely something that's interesting, but we have a, a huge backlog of interesting issues. And so that would help us prioritize. Nice. And then another uh, comment uh, slash discussion point, and that's around importing entities into the CDK for Terraform. Uh, the, this, this person's planning to move over to the CDK uh, for Terraform 100%. And so any insights around getting that done and making that transition smoother, I can see why the import topic would come up. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on, on those, Daniel and, and the rest of the team? I, I think that by import, you probably mean uh, doing a state import as well. Uh, that would sort of like convert, you know, what, the, what my ideal experience there would be, would be if I've got a project already, I've got in, in HCL, uh, I've got, got it deployed, I have some amount of state, I would like to do a conversion there that results in you know, TypeScript, Python, whatever my favorite language is, um, and ideally works with existing state, which is not a guarantee we're able to make right now. Um, I, I hate to keep giving the same answer, but again, this is very much, that is definitely a thing we could do. And every now and then somebody asks for it, but it's really hard for me so far to gauge what the level of community demand for it is. And so um, if it's something you're interested in, please file an issue and other folks like, you know, pile on the, the upvoted issues definitely catch our attention. Um, and yeah, talk about like, you know, like Sarah keeps saying, like talk about the specific use cases there too. Like, are, are you doing that in Terraform Cloud? Are you, is that local state? Or would you wanna, you know, are you okay if we're changing state to convert it? Are you hoping to concurrently manage this with both? What's, what's, the, what's the interest? So, but yeah, please, please file something there. Well, I believe that's all we have in terms of QA. In terms of last things here, did, did, were there any other points that anyone would like to share before we close things out? Mm, no, all right. <laughs> oh, Daniel, you muted. Yeah, I just wanna, I just wanna plug that, uh, keep your eyes peeled for our next release is coming right during HashiConf. And so keep your eyes peeled there. Uh, there's some interesting stuff in the works that I would, you know, definitely, I think people will be interested in. So uh, definitely go watch HashiConf. There's also an upcoming community office hours with the pocket folks who are some of the earliest, most active uh, production users of CDK for Terraform from Mozilla Pocket. What's really cool about them is they have an open source CDK for Terraform code base. So they're an absolutely rich source of sort of examples, usage patterns for folks who asked about best practices. Um, you know, going and looking at the Mozilla Pocket CDK code base and doing everything exactly the same as them, uh, it's hard to go wrong. So uh, yeah, stay tuned to learn more about what they are, what they're doing. They're gonna walk us through some of how they work. For sure. Uh, I do see a comment from Jordan that uh, in the chat, that's a, it's a bit more generalized to Terraform in general, in, in general and it's just around managing resources efficiently. And so the, the example is uh, using Terraform to destroy instances if they're, if they're not being used. Uh, with that, there's a number of ways you could go about getting that done. Uh, some of those are going to just be straight within your cloud provider, just setting up like auto scaling and setting up, setting up metrics to watch for those changes. So if a particular instance 
or, or you're just the metrics across your entire auto scaling group, for example, aren't above a certain level, shoot, sending off a trigger and those going down. But that's going to be, and you, anyone can step in to correct me if I'm wrong, but that's going to be less something Terraform is going to be doing for you actively and more something that you can figure uh, through Terraform for your cloud provider. So hopefully that answers the, your- The, the one thing I might add, the one implementation, just having seen a couple companies do this, one thing you can do through Terraform that'll help is you can enforce tagging of AWS resources this way, and then use some entirely other tool to do reaping. So if you tag resources with, like I've seen people tag resources with an ex expected expiration date, uh, if they're, you know, if it's test infrastructure, toy infrastructure, messing around, and you, you don't, there's no reason this machine should be around for more than a month. You tag it that way, and then you have some kind of Reaper script go and terminate those. If you're doing your provisioning through Terraform, you can enforce consistent tagging um, and support that kind of workflow. But you're exactly right, Cole. This is generally something you would do maybe in part with Terraform, but you would do the actual destroy elsewhere and be super careful about doing this kind of thing against production. I have definitely seen outages as a result of over-enthusiastic reaping. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> scaling up's never the problem. It's the scaling down where it can get fishy. So, yeah. All right. Well, wrapping things up, we've got our big takeaways. We had our big community contributor, John, on the stream today, our new product manager for the CDK for Terraform, Sarah also introduced today. And then our three, well, our, our three features, our big one being the testing story where we brought in snapshot testing through Jest, and then being able to use Terraform functions directly in the CDK without the escape hatch, and then bash Zish completion, which, you know, even though it took us like a few seconds to demo it, that will save you collectively over the next year if you're using that command a lot, uh, who knows how much time. And uh, the last things I'd say is that if you wanna get started with the CDK, uh, or get involved, we do have a number of learn guides on our Learn HashiCorp platform that can get you into it. Uh, if you're looking for best practices and things and such, obviously those are coming through documentation as we've stated, but we do have the Mozilla Pocket as a very good source of information since they use it in production and their uh, all of their code is open source. Uh, if you want to get involved in open source and you want to see new features, the best way is to go to the GitHub repo, file an issue, explain your use case, give us specifics, and that it will absolutely look at it. And that is the, I would say, probably the, the best way to get it on the roadmap and get it visibility. And if you have any other success or failure stories, uh, at least as of last time, Daniel Dreyer would love to hear about those uh, since he is a... Uh, Yes, the, the, the sounding board for all of those things. So that wraps up we've got today for Community Office Hours. Thank you, Sarah, John, Daniel, and Sebastian for joining us. And uh, thank you for watching. Cool, thank you so much. This has been really thank good. Thank you. Thank you.